So um, just to explain a little bit about myself, um, I am a resident, which means that I am a veterinarian who is specializing in something, and the something that I'm specializing in is shelter medicine, and that is a brand new specialty as of a couple years ago, and we just had our very first cohort of people take the exam this year, and so now there are actually three AVBP shelter, boarded shelter medicine practitioners in the country, and I hope to join their ranks in 2017 when I take my exam. Um, and I'm also doing a Master's of Science in Public Health and uh, Shelter Medicine at the University of Florida as part of my program, which is why I have all of these logos, that, as you can see. Um, my residency is through Oregon State University. It's funded by Maddie's Fund, but I work almost all of my time at the Oregon Humane Society, and I live here in Portland. So today I'm going to talk about feline health, um, feline behavior, and how stress relates to both of those things in the animal shelter and what we can do as uh, people that make decisions about where we're putting cats to uh, decrease the stress and improve the health and behavior of the cats that we take care of. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, what stress is. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this meme, you're probably feeling a little stressed already, just in anticipation. But um, stress is a normal thing. It's a normal reaction to danger or excitement um, situations that we find ourselves in. It's a physiological response. So when I'm talking about stress, I'm talking about hormones and other biochemicals that are coursing through our bloodstreams, cats' bloodstreams, dogs' bloodstreams, that lead us to act or feel in certain ways. Uh, there's three main types of stress. We can divide them by the time at which these hormones and biochemicals are released. The first one is primary stress, which happens roughly one to two seconds. We would almost consider it immediate, um, and it's mainly driven by adrenaline. And so this is where this comes in here. Look at the cat. Look at the cat. Oh, there it is. Okay. That's stress. That is adrenaline. That is primary stress. If, we, if that cat stays there and that cucumber stays there, the cat's going to get used to it and is not going to be stressed out about it anymore. But in this situation, this is just a perfect example of the primary stress that we're talking about. Secondary stress is about 20 to 60 seconds. And this is powered by adrenaline and by norepinephrine. And these hormones together help us do incredible things, like scramble up the mountain behind where the lion is chasing us, or get away from the bear, or get out of the way of that moving truck, or something like that. Um, it, they help us to um, dilate our bronchioles, to get our heart rate going, to uh, release sugar into our bloodstream, all of these things that help us get out of the way. Totally normal response. It's a good thing when we get this in the right circumstances because it saves us. Tertiary stress is the same thing as chronic stress, and that is stress that it goes anywhere from a minute to weeks or years or months or however long it is that the conditions are stressful to us. And this is primarily controlled by the hormone cortisol, which I'm sure that you guys have heard of before. Uh, there's also uh, DHEA involved and thyroid hormones involved. And all of these different hormones cause significant changes to our biochemistry and physiology. They do all sorts of different things to us. And these are responsible for the deleterious consequences that we see in a lot of cats in the shelter when they are stressed out. So the stress that I'm talking about from here on throughout the lecture is this tertiary stress, this chronic stress that these poor cats are subjected to. What causes stress? So we talked a little bit about um, bears and uh, trucks. But so if for a cat, novelty, which is I think where the cucumber thing comes in, certainly causes a certain amount of stress. So if I put you in a brand new situation and I don't give you any warning about it, you're going to feel a certain amount of stress. And that's going to be adrenaline at first, and then some norepinephrine, and then eventually cortisol. And all these changes are going to happen to your body. The physical environment can cause stress. So what types of changes to the physical environment do you find stressful? What about like in the winter in Minnesota? <laughs> you, can, you can say something if you want. The, the polar vortex, yeah, absolutely. That's stressful. What if you're on a desert island and you don't have any shade? The heat, right? So. Um, in the shelter, if you are in a cat and you're living in the dog kennel and there's that barking dogs all around, that's going to be a physical environment that is causing you some stress. There's also having a physical ailment or an illness that can cause stress. So if I broke my leg because I didn't get out of the way of the truck soon enough, or if the alligator got me, that's going to cause me a certain amount of stress 
even long after both of those objects have disappeared. Um, and that can be you know, just a headache or it can be like a severe injury. Social interactions are also very stressful. Um, maybe I have a, <laughs> maybe, I do have an interview with Cornell University next week um, and I am feeling a little stressed out about this. Um, it's a social stress that I'm feeling because I want to do really well, I want to impress them, I want them to hire me. So um, I'm feeling a certain amount of stress because of this social interaction. The same type of physiological response though is gonna happen if I'm walking down the alleyway behind Voodoo Donuts and I hear a rustle behind me. That's social stress. If there's somebody back there, I'm, a, I'm feeling stressed out about them being there, but it's different kind of stress than I'm feeling about going to meet Elizabeth Berliner in Cornell. Um, lack of access to resources is certainly stressful. I get hungry very quickly. I don't know about you guys. Um, <laughs> if, I, uh, if I don't have water and I'm feeling really thirsty in surgery because I've been standing there for six hours and I've got another cat on the table, that's stressful to me. The same is true of cats and dogs. Stray cats um, and feral cats that we trap in traps, we don't know how long they've been there sometimes. We don't know long, how long they've uh, been without the food and water that we should give them. And so it's something to think about when we're dealing with ferals. And then lack of control of the environment. And this is probably the thing that the cats in the shelter um, are most stressed out about. So they are in this situation, they're in their cages, and they can't get away from what's happening to them. They can't get away from the sound, they can't get away from the people looking at them, they can't get away from the other cats, and that's very stressful for them. So let's take a look at these pictures and see if you can see what might be stressful about these situations. So what, what about this guy? Yeah, it's a physical ailment, I think. Some sort of upper respiratory infection, probably herpes, because it's got an eyeball involved. Um, what about these guys? Social. I would say social. <laughs> social, there's so way too many cats in there. Also, maybe lack of resources. It looks like there's litter in here and not water. And this, I'm not really sure if that's food, because you see how it's on the bars? Like, it might not be food. Maybe it's something else. What about this cat, this stray cat, and this <laughs> guy right here? Have you guys seen that video? It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so um, a lot of different things cause stress, and we can certainly appreciate, we can identify those things in, in the shelter and in other contexts. So we know when it's probably true that this <laughs> is the situation. All right, how do scientists measure stress? Um, th this is a list of things that the papers that I read about cats being stressed in the shelter are, are doing to measure the stress. So biochemical changes. So we talked about cortisol and all the different changes that cortisol does to the body. Well, we can measure the cortisol directly in different places. So fecal cortisol is actually my favorite because you don't have to stress the cat out to collect it. Um, and it's fairly simple to get this done at a laboratory. But you can also do urine cortisol Recently, there's a paper that came out uh, with hair cortisol, which is kind of cool. We'll talk about that later. Um, you can also look at a CBC, so you'd see a stress leukogram. Um, or maybe you can look at neurotransmitters like chemogranins, uh, part of the immune system. The immune system is very sensitive to cortisol. Um, or uh, a couple of my favorite papers in the world on cats and stress in the shelter measure the serum Ig or the stool IgA. So this is an antibody that the body produces. It produces more in the absence of cortisol and less in the presence of cortisol. So if your fecal IgA is low, that means that you're not stressed, or that you are stressed out, and if it's high, that means that you're not stressed out. The same is true with IgG in the bloodstream. So you have to be careful a little bit with these guys because you don't want to cause stress when you're collecting your sample. Um, and then behavior observations, a lot of times are, they try to correlate these uh, stress biochemical markers with behavior observations that they are seeing in the shelter. And these include things like, is the cat acting aggressively? What do we mean by that? Well, is the cat trying to bite? Is the cat hissing? Is the cat swatting? Um, one of the other things we like to measure is vigilance. So is the cat sitting there really focused on everything that is going on? Are they paying attention to everything instead of just relaxing and sleeping? Loss of maintenance behaviors. So is the cat not grooming? Is the cat not eating? Is the cat not doing normal cat things? Um, feigning sleep is one that we see very commonly in the shelter. It's something that takes a little bit of um, education to notice, but it's a cat that's sitting there. You think it's sleeping, but it's actually upright, and you may notice that every once in a while the ear is twitching at you or like an eye cracks open. 
And I was like, I, I know you're there. I'm still paying attention, but I'm pretending like I'm asleep because I don't want you to do anything over here. It's definitely a sign of stress, and we definitely care about it when we see it in the shelter. And then inactivity. So if you measure uh, a cat in a room with other cats, they're you know, bouncing around, they're sleeping, they're moving around from place to place. But if you measure what a cat does in a stainless steel cage by itself, they sit there. And I don't do a whole lot. And you can use activity monitors and you know, like those uh, Fitbit type things to see how much they move. And studies have shown that cats that are in stainless steel cages don't move as much as cats that are in places where they have a lot more animals and people and things to interact with. How do shelters measure stress? Well, we don't go around collecting fecal cortisol samples most of the time. Um, we do look at upper respiratory infection rates. So cortisol decreases the immune function. When the immune function is decreased, a lot of infections uh, that are latent can come out again. So herpes virus in particular in cats is very good at coming out when a cat is feeling stressed. And if you look at the number of cats that have upper respiratory infections, in one shelter versus the number of cats that have upper respiratory infections in the second shelter, I can tell you in which shelter those cats are more stressed out by the percentage. Um, except if they're having an outbreak of something like Khaleesi, which is a different story. Um, appetite scores. So we are very good at the Oregon Humane Society about looking at whether our cats are eating, and we give them a score, one to four, how much they're consuming on a daily basis. Actually, twice daily, um, because we're like that. Um, we notice that when cats are feeling stressed, they don't eat very well. The same is true of uh, weight loss, same idea. Cats don't drink, they don't eat, they lose weight. It can be a sign of stress, it can be a sign of some other physical disease, and we need to make sure that it's not that other physical disease when they are not eating, but we certainly see this a lot with stressed cats. Fearful or aggressive behavior. How many of you guys have seen this feral cat come into your shelter, and then you give it, like, five to seven days, and all of a sudden it's the sweetest thing that you've ever seen, and it's jumping up in your lap and it's purring. Well, the reason the cat was acting that way was because he was stressed. And now he's feeling better because he's adapted to the environment, and he's feeling playful and friendly again. And then the other thing that I look at, which is kind of a shelter academic way of measuring stress in the shelter, is length of stay. And I'm talking about when an animal comes in to the time that they leave, whatever, however route they leave, however way they come in, if that's longer, I can almost guarantee you that those cats are feeling more stress in the shelter than when it's shorter. And uh, I don't have a huge number of examples of that one for you today, but we can talk about that after if you have any questions. Other medical consequences of chronic illness, or chronic stress, excuse me, ringworm. So that study where they were looking at cortisol in the hair, they were measuring the difference between cats that have ringworm and cats that don't. And cats that have ringworm have higher cortisol levels in their hair than cats that don't. So stress is probably playing a role in cats acquiring ringworm infection. Diarrhea is one that we see a lot in this shelter. A lot of times we think that the diarrhea is due to parasites or it's due to bacteria or it's due to viruses. Um, sometimes it's due to stress. And sometimes that stress can be really important because maybe it's reactivating the shedding of coronavirus. And we care about that, that a lot in shelters because that's where FIP comes from. And we don't want that to happen to anybody. Hepatic lipidosis. So I was mentioning that stress can lead to anorexia. In cats, if you have a cat that's an older cat that has some fat reserves, when they don't eat, those fat reserves are mobilized and that fat then ends up as deposits in hepatocytes in the liver and prevents the liver from functioning properly and can lead to death due to liver failure. And that's something that you have to be really careful with. Um, force feeding is pretty much the only way to get them back. Idiopathic cystitis is a disease that's strongly linked to stress in cats. Um, it's not so much of a problem when you're a female cat. Um, basically, what we're talking about here is the inflammation that's in the lining of the bladder and sloughing of cells and bleeding into the urine. And when you're a female cat and you have a nice wide urethra that comes out pretty normally, but when you're a male cat and you have this tiny little long urethra, you can get that sludge that you're sloughing gets stuck in that urethra and doesn't allow the cat to urinate. And that can also lead to the animal dying of sepsis, shock, and then sometimes the heart stops because the potassium goes up so high. Don't want that to happen either. And then secondary respiratory pathogens. So we mentioned that upper respiratory infections are very common in cats that are stressed out, especially in the shelter. 
and you see this um, as pneumonia or as uh, ocular infections due to bacteria that are secondary to upper respiratory infections. Other effects of chronic stress, and that's sort of on the behavior side, um, but also more biochemical. Um, in the hippocampus, if you are subject to chronic cortisol, you get decreased sociability and impaired memory. So cats have a harder time adapting to what they're seeing, and they also don't do behaviors that will make them feel better, like be social with people and other cats. In the prefrontal cortex, the size of your prefrontal cortex actually goes down in uh, chronic stress, and you end up with emotional and cognitive impairment, which doesn't help you to adapt to your situation. And the amygdala actually grows in size. The amygdala is sort of the fear and panic center in the brain. And that actually has more connections in, in cases of chronic stress. And it means that the animals then feel fear more easily, um, that, they, that freeze, fight, flight um, is triggered more easily, and that they actually perceive more things that are benign as threatening. And so all of these things, if you have chronic stress, can happen and make actually, it's sort of a maladaption syndrome here. Um, leads to increased anxiety and social avoidance, which doesn't help the cat adapt to the stress. So what have we learned from shelter studies? This is a pretty broad overview here. Um, we learned that specifically cats don't like to hear dogs. Even cats that like dogs don't like that dogs that much. Um, so if you can simply move your cats away from the dogs, you can actually help them quite a lot. Many cats don't like to be housed alone. They like companionship, especially when they come in from a place where they've been around other cats. They really like to be around other cats, and especially if they're young. It's important for their social development. It's also important for their enrichment. It's also important for their decreased stress. Cats don't like their house cleaned or moved very often. So cats are territorial creatures. They have facial pheromones and other pheromones that they leave on everything, including you, including me. I'm sure I have some on me right now. Um, and when you remove all, everything in their cage, you clean it, and you put all sorts of new things back in, they have to start all over again. They don't feel very comfortable in that situation. So spot cleaning is great, and keeping them where they put them in the first place is great for cats in the shelter. Cats don't like crowded shelters. Well, I don't, so I know that crowded shelters lead to infections. I know that crowded shelters lead to stress. Um, and so that's my sort of take on all these other studies where they show that um, Cats don't like the crowded shelters. And then cats do better the less time they spend in the shelter. So if you were to just study cats that spent five days in a shelter versus cats that, that spent three weeks in a shelter, the cats that spent five days there are doing better in their adopted homes, they're healthier, they didn't get sick, versus the cats that were there for three weeks or longer. And so these are things that we have shown in studies recently that cats don't like. What, now what do cats like? Well, they like hiding places. So even if you have a really crappy cage, if you put a hiding place in there, at least they can choose whether to be exposed or not, control over their environment. Cats like shelves and ele elevation. It's probably the same reason. You can see this, this guy here sitting outside and exposed to all the world, but he's feeling a little bit safer because he's elevated himself up on that shelf. Cats like space or walls between their food and litter. Not rocket science. I don't like to eat next to my poop. I'm sure that they don't either. And they actually, uh, when you have that amount of space in there, studies have shown they acquire upper respiratory infections less. So that's another measure of stress. Cats like room to stretch out and turn around. Seems pretty obvious, even though they had to do a study to prove that. And cats like attention and petting, even when they're anxious. And this is the uh, fecal IgA studies we were talking about. Um, cats that were marked as anxious when they first came into this shelter were put into two groups. One group where they were received petting for 10 minutes four times a day, and one group where they did not receive petting for 10 minutes four times a day, but somebody just stood there you know, like this next to them. The cats that received petting had fewer upper respiratory infections. They uh, were a lot more social than the cats, and then they had higher IgA in their stool, so their cortisol was actually lower. So really interesting. Also true of cats that are not anxious, by the way. That one just came out in October. So now I'm going to just briefly go over the top five innovations in cat sheltering um, and give you a really quick case study of a shelter that put all these things into place and what happened to the cats there. Um, and I, I think, how long do I have? Another like 10? Is that OK? OK, great. All right. So 
I don't think I've ever been on a shelter tour or consultation where I haven't suggested that the shelter put in portals. Portals are holes in between two cages. The shelter industry decided in the 1980s that cats like to live in two by two microwave oven st sized <laughs> stainless steel cages with a bar in the front. Or maybe it was the shelter workers because they can clean them really easily. But portals are holes in between two of those cages, or more, more is better, um, where cats can go back and forth. And so as you can see, this is what this kitten is doing right here, um, going back and forth. Um, cats in the, okay, this is a different law. This is the law of physics. Um, so the law that I'm actually talking about is public health and safety laws. So laws about stray cats are changing throughout the country um, in ways that let us leave cats in environments where they are doing well, remove them from the environments where they're not, and not penalize people for taking care of cats that are outside. And the other thing that laws are changing to do is to help us to spay and neuter all of the cats that we are finding around. Some, some because there's laws that you can't adopt cats out without spay and neuter, some that all cats in the community have to be spayed and neutered, and some where all cats that uh, come into contact with some sort of uh, entity, law enforcement, uh, veterinary clinic or whatever, have to be spayed and neutered. And that's one, like in Texas here, a community cats says, in addition to the state mandatory rabies vaccination, outside cats, both owned and unowned, must be spayed and neutered. So if you see a cat and it's not spayed and neutered and it's on your property, you are responsible for getting that cat spayed and neutered, which is fantastic because it means that we're actually making a dent. Focus on flow throw. So this is something that I also pretty much tell every shelter that I visit that is important. It's a business concept. So if you have a, you know, a raw material and a final product, getting that raw material into a final product as soon as possible means that you have more resources to spend on the next raw material that you are getting into the final product shape. And what this means in the shelter is um, focusing on getting an animal adoptable as soon as possible. And what that means may be spay and neuter, it may be waiting for a stray period to be up, it may be addressing some minor medical condition, it may be keeping them healthy so they don't get sick they don't need to be in isolation for two weeks having upper respiratory or four weeks having ringworm, and getting them out the door as soon as possible to adopters that want them and don't bring them back. And so this flow through um, process uh, with sort of the business mindset has actually helped a lot of shelters um, get their cat population under control really well. It's intense, it takes time, but it works really well to get the cats out of there. Um, trap, neuter, return. I and mean, this is not just feral cats anymore, but also cats that are, we call community cats. So cats that are friendly, that come up to you, that beg for food at your back door and then leave. And then you see them again three weeks later and then they, you give them some food and they leave. And cats like that don't belong in a shelter because they're doing really well in the environment, what they're in, but they're not feral and they're not stray, really. They just kind of sit there in the community because stray means that they belong to somebody but they don't belong to that person anymore. So having trap, neuter, return for feral cats that don't belong in human structures and community cats that do really well in the environments that they came from has really cut down on the population of cats in shelters and made it so that we can spend the resources on the cats we have and not on cats that don't do well. Um, also, ear tips. If you see an ear-tipped cat, just leave it where it is. Um, and then community spay-neuter. So these are cats that are owned by people that may... Um, be an underserved or have uh, sort of poverty issues that we can get spayed and neutered for very low cost and that prevents kittens and other cats from coming into the shelter. And that is actually the main source of kittens and cats coming into the shelter. And so if we can get this to prevent this before these cats are actually born, we can actually prevent a lot of stress in the shelter for cats that are then subjected to crowded conditions. So here is an example of a city that decided to adopt these five innovations to see where it took them. This is the city of Waco, Texas. Um, and as you can see from this graph, we have um, about 75% of the cats that come into their care are euthanized. And about 25 actually make it out alive, and that's through adoption and through rescue. And so average normal cat coming in, 
probably going to be euthanized. So cats were living in two foot by one and a half foot stainless steel cages. They had about 150 of these because that's about how many cats lived in the shelter at any one day. The cats were held in cages for several days to make sure that they were healthy because, because they euthanized so many animals, they didn't want to put any resources into animals that were going to be ill or that didn't have very good behavior. And so they had this intensive sort of monitoring system waiting for something to happen to them before they moved them on to the next steps. And this is where flow through kind of came in. Feral cats were caught in traps and shoved into cages in the shelter, held for three to five days, and then euthanized because they didn't have anywhere to place feral cats and people didn't like the feral cats and they didn't have any other solutions up their sleeves for them. And these are wild animals. I mean, imagine doing this with a raccoon or with a, a possum or something, just putting it in a cage, waiting five days to see what happens because nobody, they, they stray laws, right? So you have to see if somebody's gonna come pick it up and claim it as a pet and then they would euthanize it because feral cats, that was the rule, euthanize them. And as you can see, because 2006 to 2012, euthanizing feral cats was not doing anything as far as decreasing the population of cats that were coming into the shelter. And then they were charging fees to people who came in to reclaim their cats because they wanted to recoup some money from the care that they were giving to the cats. But a lot of people couldn't afford those fees. They were $150, $200 to reclaim the cat, especially if it wasn't spayed or neutered. And people couldn't afford that, so the cat stayed there and then got euthanized. And then they had one outside clinic that they were using for spay neuter. And that one outside clinic couldn't handle the volume of cats that they had ready to spay neuter. So then the cats would sit and wait for spay neuter for days, weeks sometimes. And then they would get sick and they would have to wait. And then they would finally be able to go to spay neuter if they weren't euthanized because they were sick. So, you feel like this is just horrible and nobody, that nothing is going to be able to fix this, right? This is what it looked like. It's cats crammed into these tiny little microwave ovens. This is Waco now. So they have a feral cat TNR program called Feral Freedom. None of the feral cats are coming into the shelter now. If they come in in a trap, they get immediately sent over to the building where they do the feral cat spay neuter and then they get put back where they were. And yeah, some of the residents don't like it, but the residents didn't want to come and euthanize them themselves, so they are putting up with it. <laughs> community cat legislation. So they actually changed the laws. That law that I read you before with the community cats, that's Waco, Texas. So they changed that in 2014 to allow for cats to be roaming. Focus on flow through. So they got rid of all of these holding periods. So now if a cat comes in that's owner surrendered and it's spayed, neutered, and vaccinated, it goes onto the adoption floor that same hour. So it's available for adoption to go home that same day if somebody wants it. Portals in small cat cages. So they actually have put portals in all the cages, but they're actually getting rid of those steel cages this year because they're doing a big renovation. So they're not even going to have those portals anymore. They're going to have really nice big cat condos now, which is fantastic. But the portals were a great stopgap measure. And now they have the ability to waive those reclaim fees. So somebody comes in and says, oh, that's my cat. And they're like, take it, leave. <laughs> and all the cats that are there are really appreciative of all of these changes. So... And then they also recruited three more area clinic, spay neuter clinics to keep up with their spay neuter needs for community cats and for cats that are in the shelter and for the feral TNR stuff. And then they are working together with, the, so the city of Waco Animal Services is working with the Waco Humane Society, I think it's Central Texas Humane Society, is working with Furry Friends Rescue, is working with the legislature, and everybody is working together on this one problem. All of these interventions, by the way, were recommended by Target Zero Institute, which is run by Sarah Paisano, who's a veterinarian out of, uh, I think she went to Davis. She and her company have managed to turn, I think, six or seven cities now into this. Oh, come on, go, go. So 2011, right, where about two-thirds of the cats that came in were euthanized. 2013 was when TZI came in. So you can see that for the first time in, I think, the entire history of the organization, they had fewer, euthanasia, or fewer euthanasias than live releases. And then in 2013, 2014 fiscal year, they only euthanized 350 cats, and they adopted out the same number. And then last year, they only, adopt, they only euthanized 140 cats, and they adopted out the same number. And then they're on track to be over 90% live release this year. And that's no kill. Like, that's what no kill means. 
So this, you just do these five things in the shelter, decrease that cat stress, every cat becomes adoptable. And you can do that. So we went from this to this. So we have group rooms, enrichment, portals, and adoptions. So just a summary here. How animals feel about their environment and their situation actually causes physical changes and biochemical changes. Shelters are stressful places. No matter what we do to make them better, the novelty, the noise, the physical changes, it's a stressful thing that we're putting on these cats. It sets these cats up for disease and behavior problems, but we can control their environments and we can make it better. So thank you very much. Thank you.